So this class tonight is what I should have done last week, but I had a bit of an emergency last week and I had to switch things up a little bit. So the class that I taught last week is sort of a, you know, not automatic for me, but it's an easy class to teach, so I just grabbed at it because I had no time at all to prepare, literally no time. So tonight's class is, in fact, what, what we should have done last week, which is class two of Torah three. Torah three is class two. T t it's what, what we're doing tonight. Uh -huh. Torah. There's no, there's no Torah three. Prophets three, class two, is what we're going to be doing tonight. And it is the glory of God. We talked a little bit about this. In fact, we talked quite a bit about this, about this last week. Last week we talked about the glory of God that would depart from Jerusalem, that God in fact would remove from Jerusalem, particularly the mercy seat in the temple, and then it will ascend from the Mount of Olives, and that's the last time we saw it. Let me just adjust the ear a little bit. Oh, you dropped it? Okay. <coughs> All right, and we talked about the glory of God, how it would, if you recall, remove itself, or God will remove it from the mercy seat to the door of the temple, then to the gate of the temple, and then further east towards the, the Mount of Olives, the mountain to the east. And from there we don't see it again. And then we talked about how the angel said to Jesus, uh, when, you know, t said to uh, his disciples on the Mount of Olives, when he ascended, that this Jesus that you see here, now ascended, will in the same way return. And he will bring with him the glory of God. We talked about all of that last week. And when he does, we know that he's going to skip across that valley in the glory of God and position himself in that third temple. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit, a little, a little bit more tonight about the glory of God. So let's, let's pray and begin. Father God, we thank you and praise you. We ask, O oh Lord, for your insight, your wisdom, your direction. We pray, Lord, for your spirit to fill us, O oh Lord, and give us even more of yourself, more of your, your revelation insight, and give us more of your love. Help us, Lord, to better serve you and to honor you in this day. We praise you, Father God. We bless your holy name. Amen. So, of course, tonight's class is class two of Prophets three, the glory of God. Nice new board. Tonight we're going to look at the association between the glory of God, the living creatures, which are the cherubim, and the throne of God. So that's, that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to see that there's a direct connection between the three. All right? So... So tonight we're going to be looking at the association between, of course, the glory of God, also referred to as the, the glory of the Lord, Kavod Yehovah. Right. Living creatures. Get this right. Which are the cherubim. cherubim, and of course the throne of God. The throne of God. Okay. Now, one of, the, one of the mysteries that we see in the Bible is that we don't have many literal appearances of God. We have many appearances of Jesus, Yeshua, and the angel of the Lord, who we believe sometimes can, manif can be a pre-incarnation of Jesus, a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus. So we also have when the Lord appeared to Abraham, in the person of a human being, and broke bread with Abraham, right? We, we, knew, we know about that one time. And, and what did Abraham do? He offered up a lamb 
and they had they broke bread together and and the bible it says it there very clearly in genesis that the lord appeared to abraham and he had two angels with him two messengers melachim and they broke bread together then abraham went on to to plead with with the lord to not destroy all of sodom and gomorrah you know the story because of lot so there was a there was an appearance of the lord that that dealt with Abraham, that interacted with Abraham. Now, was that the father himself? Was that God the father himself? We don't think so. We don't think so because the father himself has removed himself from creation and has commissioned his son, Yeshua, to interact with, cre with creation on, on his behalf. And that's why Jesus has the full divine nature because of the mission, because of his, his ministry, which is to be God to creation, to us, to all of creation. And so, but we don't have many examples in the Bible where there's a literal manifestation of the Father himself. Now tonight we're gonna to see a couple. And they're very rare, and of course, being that rare, they're very, they're very precious. And, and they're awesome manifestations when we see them. Now, so we're gonna talk about, now we don't wanna to get too far into the weeds dealing with the Holy Trinity concept we've dealt with that before and I think we've come to the conclusion I hope we have come to the conclusion that the father is separate from the son the son is not the father Jesus is the son he is a separate being uh, not a created being he was never created he always existed along with God he was begotten that's what Paul said in in the book of uh, the book of Colossians Jesus uh, Paul said that Jesus was the first born of all creation so, firstborn of all creation, he was not created. But we, we've talked about in, in, our, in our concept of the Trinity, we see that there is subordination, that the Father is over all, the Son is surrendered, submitted to the Father, and the Holy Spirit is doing the work of the Father through the Son. And so you see there a line of authority. So whenever you talk about God, the Father, being separate from Jesus and a, a separate manifestation, questions of the Holy Trinity always come up. And this is a very uh, a sore subject. No, it is, it is a sore subject. This is a very pressure-packed subject in the Christian landscape. Uh, you bring, this, you bring this, this, this point to bear, and you can end up being a heretic very easily. You can end up being branded a heretic. So I, 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 don't, I don't mince words too much about it. I, I, am, I am convinced that God is a triune being, I do not believe in co-equality and cons consubstantiation, which is where I believe much of Christianity goes astray in regards to the person of God, that he is consubstantial and co-equal. We've talked all about this before. So let's just, let's just leave the Trinity issue behind because tonight we're going we're gonna to discuss some subjects that's going to interfere a little bit with the concept of the Father himself being separate from the Son, being a separate being. And he has all authority, even over the Son, right? Paul says in Colossians that, that God gave all authority, the Father gave all authority to the Son. Right? Not, that's excluding himself. And Paul would go on to talk about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that the Father has excluded himself from being under Jesus' authority because all the authority that Jesus has was given to him by the Father. So that, that's pretty straightforward. You, you'd be surprised. There are many, many people that will just, I've, I've done this before, and people get up and leave because I'm interfering with their, with their golden calf, with their trinity. And they get up. It, it's, it's a real sore subject with many people. All right, so let's begin. What we have of God's actual literal being in the Bible is very precious and rare. So first we'll go to Revelation chapter 4. Now we have a lot of reading to do tonight. I'm going to ask you guys to please help me read because we've got a bunch of reading to do. And you see these funny looking glasses I have on? They're not the best for reading. Uh, believe me. They're the most expensive glasses I have ever got, like three, 350, 400. And I tell you what. My little uh, four for twelve dollars from Walmart. My <laughs> they do much better than this. 
I got I got in fact I got to go to Walmart and get another pack of those. 4 for 12 dollars. Can't beat them. This is almost 400. All right, so let me see if I can put this Bible where I can actually see to read it. So we're going to read all of Revelation chapter 4. <coughs> That's going to give us a picture of the Holy One of Israel, the Father himself. Let me read Revelation 4, and then you guys can also read some as we go along. Wow. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Now, ironically enough, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 is where the pre-tribulationists, this is where they get the idea of the rapture happening before the tribulation. It's, it's bizarre, but this is how they end up with the rapture being before the pre-tribulation. I'm going to read it, and you'll understand why. Later on, maybe in a couple of, maybe four weeks, we'll talk about the pre-trib rapture. I'll get you all the information. I'll put a class together for you, and you'll see it yourself. But this is, this is how they ended up with the pre-trib rapture. Oh, they didn't. No. This is one of the scriptural references that, that's used to support the pre-trib rapture. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here and I will show you uh, what must take place after these things. That's the rapture. So you just, we, just, we just witnessed the rapture according to the people who are pre-tribulationists. Now, the voice that spoke to John, for what purpose is he being taken up into the throne room? So that he can see what's about to happen and report it, right? As far as I'm concerned, there's no rapture occurring here, no resurrection transformation of the church and coming before God. This is John being taken in a vision. What we'll see tonight is that even Ezekiel was taken up in a vision as well. Certainly wasn't raptured. All right? in, two, in two cases, in two instances, Ezekiel was taken into the, the spirit realm. This is where John is. And he's shown things in heaven. All right, so let's read. <clears throat> Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. This is the one sitting on the throne is the Holy One of Israel. So you see there's a throne. He's, he, he, immediately he's taken into heaven, and he sees the throne of God. The one stand, sitting on the throne is God. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones... I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garment, and golden crowns were on their heads. Now, sometimes when we read this, we, 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 we kind of wonder who these elders are. And we can only speculate. We, we don't know. There's no way we can know who these elders are. But they're 24 elders. And so some people would speculate and say, well, they're the 12 sons of Jacob and the 12 apostles. You know, maybe 12 and 12, 24. So you have the 12 apostles, the 12 sons of, of Israel. I don't think so, because John himself is one of the apostles, and he's standing there, and he's seen everything in the room. So, uh, you know, who knows who the 24 are? Maybe you can go through and select from the Bible uh, some of the elders of the Bible, like Abraham, Noah, uh, Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Daniel. Maybe you can do this, but it really doesn't matter, does it? We don't know who these elders are. But they're in the throne room of God, and there are 12, excuse me, there are 24 thrones that are set before them, 24 crowns. Out from the throne comes flashes of lightning, sounds of peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps, seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Each are, each are the seven spirits of God. Now, these are menorahs, okay? They, these are menorahs because in Revelation chapter 2, and, and one as well, Jesus identified the seven light candle stands as the menorahs, representing the seven spirits. So these are seven menorahs that are in the throne room of God. And then verse 6, And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. We'll see this again. So where God is on his throne... You have 24 elders, right? You have, you have a sea of glass that's set before God. Like, and it says it's like crystal. So this sea of glass, we don't quite understand it, but it's, it's, it's like, he says it's like crystal. It's not really crystal. 
It's like crystal. One of the things we have to keep in mind as we read through this tonight is that John and Ezekiel, they're seeing things that they don't know exactly what they are. And they are going to use objects and things from their frame of reference to try and describe what they're seeing. So what he sees is something like a sea of glass, something like crystal. It doesn't mean that it's a sea of glass or it's crystal, right? They're doing their best. They're using their frame of reference to describe what they're seeing. So we don't know what this was or what it is. Whatever it is, it still exists. It's in that throne room of God. Yes? Seven, well, Jesus speaks about the seven spirits that are, that are keeping watch over God's creation. So seven menorahs representing seven spirits that are going out into the world, perhaps, and, and I, I don't know exactly what they're referring to. You have, in, in this, you have a bit of a mystery that we don't quite understand. But, you know, it suffice to say that there are seven menorahs, and each menorah represents seven spirits, seven lights, seven spirits. Well, I think the Holy Spirit is separate from these. This is where the mystery comes in. Yeah, this is where the mystery comes in. <clears throat> All right, and so verse 6, let me read verse 6 again. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in it, and in the center, and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in the front and behind. Now we're seeing the living creatures, right? So four living creatures. What we're going to discover in the book of Ezekiel is that these living creatures are cherubim. And they have eyes all around them. So that's a little bit of a, a mystery right there in and of itself. These living creatures are not anything that we can, that, that we can draw reference to in our, in our frame of reference. They have eyes all around them. What is that? I, I have no idea. It's, they're different. Different than anything else that exists in creation. Verse 7. The first creature was like a lion. The second creature was like a calf. The third creature had the face of a man, and the fourth creature had, uh, was like a flying eagle. We'll see this again in Ezekiel. So these cherubim are very different than anything we've ever seen. Apparently, they have eyes all around. They have faces, I guess, all around. You have the face of an eagle, face, the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of a calf or a bull. So that's pretty amazing in and of itself. So again... It's, it's hard to visualize this. I've seen uh, artists' renderings of these things. You know, different artists have tried to make, to, to, to make a drawing, a rendering of what these things look like, and it, they're just, you just can't even envision what they, what they must look like. The first creature was like, all right, so verse 8. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes, full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. So what are these living creatures doing? These awesome beings? Day and night, they're praising God. Now keep that in mind for when we go through the book of Ezekiel, because this is also true for what they would be doing in the book of Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel doesn't report them as praising God. John does. So these living creatures, these cherubim, day and night, they never cease to praise God. Verse, uh, verse 10. No, no, verse 9. And when the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him, before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Would you, you, O Lord God, O Lord, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power? For you created all things and because of your will they existed and they were created. So again, now here we see more worship in heaven. The, the 24 elders are worshiping God along with the living creatures. Seems like the living creatures are leading in the worship. And as they worship, there's, there's sort of a, a, a rise in worship, an, an ascension in worship. 
and then the elders get involved. And so you have to try and picture the, the throne room of God, what that must be like. So you know, we, we, here at Fellowship, we have some dimension of worship. We experience some dimension of worship. Perhaps not as much, not near as much as what we're looking at here in the throne room of God, but we experience a dimension of worship that's greater than many churches, right? And, and not, not all churches. There are churches out there that would experience a much, much profound manifestation of worship. But we have some worship here. Now, you know from worship that there are times when the worship seems to take on its own life, and it begins to ascend and grow and manifest in a bold way. Well, think about that happening around the clock. Think about that high state of worship perpetually, just, just ascending and growing and exploding. And then there are moments of quiet, and there's moments of praise, there's moments of adoration, and that's what it is in heaven, just 24-7. never ceases to be like that, uh, based on what we just read, right? So we know that the Father, God himself, is on his throne. There's praise, uh, excuse me, praise, adoration, and worship going up before him. Later on tonight, we're going to read chapter 5, where we will see Jesus at his right hand. Jesus, Yeshua, will be presented before him. He would be found worthy, right? Jesus himself will be found worthy, and he will sit at the right hand of God. We'll look at that later on. So these glasses are just, <laughs> I'm seeing three or four words at the same time. All right, let's go to, uh, now let's go to Ezekiel now. We're going to look, look at Ezekiel's account of what he saw as it relates to the living creatures. And he gives us a really full accounting of these living creatures. Goodness. I really regret not having my other glasses, my cheapos. <laughs> Aye. All right, so and now in Ezekiel chapter 1, now this is how the book of Ezekiel begins. It begins with an incredible vision that Ezekiel has. It's, it's a vision unlike anything we've seen thus far in the Bible. It's very close to what we see in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 4, but Ezekiel provides a, an incredible amount of insight and description, much more detailed description, relative to what he saw. He did not report that there was praise and adoration and worship to God, but he described quite a bit that John did not describe. Now, I'm going to read some when I feel like uh, these glasses have tormented me enough. I'll ask you guys to read. It's terrible. They're bifocals, you see, and, and they're weird because it's just... I have to, I have to, if, to read this, I have to be at a certain place, at a certain angle. <laughs> it's, it's killing me. All right, so I'm, I'm going to read Ezekiel chapter 1. I'm going to try to anyway. So now here is Ezekiel. Where is Ezekiel? Who is Ezekiel? Last week we talked about Ezekiel, a week before last. Who is Ezekiel? He is a Kohen. He's a priest. He's one of the captives uh, uh, of Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, taken captive by the Babylonians. He's, he's on the river Chiba, which is in Babylon. Now, he's probably just sitting there on the river of Chiba, waiting to, waiting to be processed into the Babylonian culture. Right? He, he, was a, 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 he was a slave, a, a, war, a captive of war. And they were not exactly treated well uh, initially. And then after a while, they would be factored into the greater society. So he's on the river Chiba, together with the other captives. Now, let's read. Now, it came about in the 30th year, on the, on the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was by the river Chiba, among the exiles, among the exiles, the heavens opened, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. So, he alone is having these visions. He's there together with other exiles, and he's having this incredible vision. On the fifth of the month, in the year of King Jehoiakim's exile, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, son of Bozai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Heba. And there the hand of the Lord came upon me. Now, you find this reference in Ezekiel. You don't find it in many other places. You find it also, I believe, in the book of Daniel, where the hand of the Lord is upon someone. 
Now, you, I think you know what that means. The hand of the Lord is heavy upon someone. It's what it's referring to. They're in the spirit. All right, so in the charismatic movement, you have the concept of being slain in the spirit, coming under the, the, the hand of God. And it's a real thing. It's, it's a real thing. When it's real, it's real. When it's not, it's not. Uh, there are imitations, and, and you, you want to avoid that because anyone falling out under the, 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 the power of a spirit, all right, it's very spiritual, but you want to be sure it's the Holy Spirit because it happens apart from the Holy Spirit. In other words, other spirits will govern those, those, those events where people are being slain in the spirit that they're coming under the power of the Holy Spirit. But, but it's real. Ezekiel is under the power of the Holy Spirit. The hand of God is upon him. As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with, with fire flashing forth continually as a bright light around it. And in the midst of, in the, in the midst, and in its midst, excuse me, something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. So he sees this incredible vision and something in the middle of this thing he sees is like glowing fire, right? This is, this is where the throne of God is. He's seeing the throne of God. Within it there were figures resembling four living beings. And this was the appearance. They had, they had human form. So these four living beings had human form. But you're going to see clearly that, that that human form is not exactly clear. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet were like calves' hoofs and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Not very human. I guess their silhouette was human, but when you, when you, when you look closer to them or at them, you see that they have hoofs feet like cows, cows hoofs like and, and what is that about they, they, they glow like burnished bronze four faces four wings these living creatures under their wings uh, under their wings on their four sides were human hands as for the face as for the faces and the wings uh, of the four of them their wings touched one another their faces did not turn when they moved, each went straight forward. That's weird, right? Their faces didn't move. They were, they, their faces were straight ahead, but they had four faces and eyes all around them. So, so we, 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 we were seeing here that these are not very natural beings, natural from our point of view. Their wings touched. So you had four, four living beings, four faces, four wings, and their wings are touching. So you envision either a square or a circle, right? And what we're going to see here is that in the middle of this square or circle is where God is, the throne of God. And so they're touching each other, but with their other wings, they have four wings, they are covering. These are the covering cherubs, and that's why they're called covering cherubs. All right, let's see if I can pick this up here. All right. In the midst of the of the living beings, there was something like something. Excuse me. Something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright, and the lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. Now it's getting strange. All right? What's going on here? <laughs> who, can, who can really understand what's going on here? Uh, Ezekiel is seeing something and he's obviously struggling. He's grappling to give a definition, a clear definition of what he's seeing. Now, wh wh what can we say about these living creatures so far? All we can say is that they're awesome. They're awesome beings. They're unnatural from our reference of what's natural and what's not natural. But clearly God, God created them. And perhaps they're more natural than we are. You understand what I'm saying? You walk about in society today and human beings are not very natural. I mean that. We're not, we're not existing. We're not existing in our created form. We're not very natural. Um, I, I hope I can say this here without getting into any trouble. You know, in the last, well, I, I've been witnessing this for about 20 years. Homosexuality has become... 
fashionable. Homosexuality is trending. It's actually trending, and it's an amazing thing to witness. I, I, uh, I called it about 20 years ago because I saw it happen and I saw the trend building. I was always good at recognizing trends, and I saw this and I said, wow, homosexuality is becoming trendy. Well, today it is. That's not natural. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I don't want to offend anyone, but as far as I'm concerned, if you want to live a homosexual life, you can go right ahead and live a homosexual life. As long as you don't impose it upon me, uh, you don't force your lifestyle upon me, we can live. We can live together. I, I disagree with your lifestyle. Uh, I, I'm not going to condemn you, right? But I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to refrain and I'm going to remain as best as I could a natural being. <laughs> so these, these living creatures are, from our point of view, not natural at all. But, like I said, in many cases, we humans are less natural than they actually are because they are existing in the form in, the form in which God created them. They're existing in that perfect form, whatever they are, whatever they truly look like, we don't know. But they're more natural than we are. And they're way beyond, in terms of their purpose and function, they're way beyond anything any human being can ever attain to. Because they are the ones who are covering God. They're covering cherubs. They're covering God and they're praising God day and night forever and ever. Wow. How would you like to be a covering cherub? You're not exactly pretty from human point of view, but, but you're, you're incredibly profound. Now this is, what, this is the position that Satan had in the original creation. Satan was, the one we call Satan, was a covering cherub. Covering cherub. According to, to, to some extra biblical writings and traditions, his name was Azael. As an angel, his name was Azael. And he was a covering cherub, created for that purpose. And he fell away from that, of course. Last night in our, our Torah 1 class, we talked about the fall of Satan and how he fell away from his from his appointed position before God as a covering cherub. What we've read so far about these living beings, these are covering cherubs, and we're going to see that in a few moments. This is what Satan was created to do. This is who he is, and he fell away from that. What we, what we read and what we see in, uh, in the book of, um, of uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 14, is that he was, there was an association between this covering cherub, Satan, and music. There was a connection between praise, music, and so that makes sense, doesn't it? If these four living beings are there to praise God day and night, forever and ever, then music was part of their ministry. And Satan had that function as well. All right. So we're not going to, I spoke about Satan enough last night. I'm not going to talk about Satan at all anymore tonight. Yes? What was that? Lucifer is not a name, actually. Lucifer is, is sort of a title or, or, or an attribute of this angel. Lucifer, the word Lucifer really means the shining one or the illuminated one. Now, in the King James, it says Lucifer. In the New American Standard, it says something entirely different. Son of the morning, uh, you know, the illuminated one. So Lucifer is not his name. Um, it's a title or it's an attribute. It's a description, an attribute of who he is, the shining one. I'm not sure why he's referred to as the shining one, but that's, that's his name. And so you've heard of, quote, unquote, the Illuminati. Where does that come from? It comes from the, the Freemason movement, the secret society movement that's interwoven with the Jesuits of the 1500s and so on. And, and they, are, they are Luciferianists. And what is, what's a Luciferianist? They are, they are people who, and, and by the way, some of our Mormon friends at their highest levels are also Luciferianists. Luciferianists. Luciferianism basically takes the position that God had two sons, Adonai and Lucifer. And Lucifer was the shining one. He was the one that was actually uh, to inherit God's, the Father's kingdom. But Adonai connived and he was wicked and worked it out to where Lucifer was cast aside. And according to the Luciferians, in the, in, the, in the final analysis, Lucifer will regain his rightful position, and Adonai would be cast away. 
Adonai is actually Jesus, according to the Luciferianists. And believe it or not, some, the, at high levels in the Mormon religion, if I can call it that, uh, there is Luciferianism. The Mormon, the Mormon faith, if I can call it that, is structured after some of these secret orders, such as the Freemasons. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ascending belief system in that you ascend to levels. And the higher the levels you, you ascend to is the more esoteric you become, the more hidden knowledge you have. And you get to the 33rd degree in the Freemason, for instance, and it's all about esotericism. It's all about secret knowledge, and you're empowered because you have the secret knowledge. And, and these are the illuminated levels in the Freemason order. And, and so, no question there, the Freemasons are, are mired in a very evil, very satanic uh, order. All right? but, but Satan, the fallen one, Satan, the word Satan means, or Satan means the adversary. This adversary was initially created to be a covering cherub. So think about that. All right, verse 15. Now, as I looked at the living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the earth besides the living beings. Uh, for each of them, for each, for, excuse me, for each of, for each of the four of them, there were a wheel, one wheel for each of the four of them. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling beryl. What color is beryl? What does beryl look like? Red. Yeah, I think beryl is red, right? So this, this wheel that was associated with each of the living creatures, there was a red light, a red illumination coming from it. Very, very strange. And all, of the four, and, and, and all four of them had the same form, their appearance and their workmanship as being as if one wheel, were in, one wheel were within another. Whenever they moved, they moved in any of their four directions without turning as they moved. As for their rims, the rims, the rims of what? The rims of the wheels. As for their rims, they were lofty and awesome. And the rims of all four of them were full of eyes, full of eyes round about. Whenever the living beings moved, the wheels moved with them. And whenever the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. Now we're into some very strange things. All right, so you got, now you have wheels that, that illuminate a red light. Wheels with inner wheels. What does that look like, a wheel within a wheel? Hmm. A wheel within a wheel. Perhaps you've seen, you've seen I, I'm not sure if you've ever seen images of renderings of, of Ezekiel's uh, chariot, what he saw. But you have a wheel that goes one way, horizontal, and another wheel that goes vertical, and the living creatures are above them. They illuminate a red light barrel, <laughs> and there are eyes all the way around it. What is that, right? So as a teenager, I, I mean, I was at the age of 12, actually, when I got my first Don Van, Von Daniken's book, Eric Von Daniken's book, Chariots of the Gods. I was 12, it was 1974, and I got his first, I got his book, Chariots of the Gods, and I consumed it. Wow, I believed it, I loved it. The idea that, that who we know as God is actually some sort of a commander of a fleet of aliens that came here from another world with, with vastly superior technology, and they seeded humanity and created the Homo sapien from the Neanderthal, all of that, all of that, information, I just absorbed all of it. I read, I read his books to follow, and by, by the age of 18, I was completely convinced I had all the answers. I had all the answers. I had it all figured out because of Van Daniken's work. Now, Eric Van Daniken, he is what? He's a pseudo-scientist. He's not really a scientist. He was actually a Jesuit priest, in case you didn't know that. He was actually a Jesuit priest who studied the book of Ezekiel as a young Jesuit, and he looked at this, this particular chapter and he said, my goodness, this, this is nothing but a UFO. It has to be a UFO. You have wheels within the wheels, you have lights, you have movement and, and strange creatures. 
So von Daniken came up with this concept that these, from reading the book of Ezekiel, these living creatures are none other than aliens. Robots, he said. And the, the wheels within the wheels with the eyes all around them are flying saucers. As a 12-year-old, I fully accepted it, all right? And so I had fully accepted it because it, it's right out of the Bible. It's historic, sacred literature that, that refers to what, from a certain point of view, is clearly some sort of an alien craft. And I, 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 I bought it hook, line, and sinker. Now, I've, since then, of course, I've, I've released all of those notions. I've released everything that I've received from Von Daniken. I've repented of Von Daniken. I used to be a Von Danikite, and I repented of all of it. Now, do I, do I feel a need to try and describe or explain what these are? Maybe a little bit, but I don't. I don't, I don't try to describe them or explain them or, or, to, or to pontificate about what they are, because that would be error. We don't know what they are. Right? It's just, it's a bit of a mystery. Yes, you had your hand up? No, my mom used to say that it was warplanes. Warplanes. Visions of the Lord and things like that. Visions in the future. Uh, yeah, stuff going on and stuff like that. Yeah, so right. it doesn't, doesn't seem that way, does it? <laughs> doesn't seem that way. You know, so, so this is an awesome, awesome vision. You got, so think about it. Let's recap what we're seeing here. We're seeing four living beings. They are connected by their wings. How large are they? We don't know. They're probably very large. We don't know. But their wings are touching, and, and, and they have four wings, and, and each, one, each one has two wings that touches the other one. They're forming a circle or a square, and the wi other wings are covering. And what we're going to see here in a few moments is that there's a being in the middle of this circle, and there's glory and lights and and barrel lights and, and wheels within the wheels. And it's just, it's, it's going to get even more amazing. So let's read. Whenever the spirit, now all of a sudden we're, he's introducing the spirit. We don't know what the spirit, he, I think from, from his point of view, there is something that's orchestrating the whole event. And he's referring to it as the spirit. Whenever the spirit was about to go, <clears throat> they would go in that direction. And the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living, cre living beings was in the wheel. <laughs> yes. Whenever those went, these went. And whenever those stood still, these stood still. And whenever those rose from the earth, the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the, the living beings was in the wheels. You see, so you could, you could see how von Daniken would come up with these ideas, right? So the living creatures are simply robots, right? The mechanism or the power that, that's directing the, the robots are coming from the wheels, the, according to von Daniken, the flying saucers. And, and Ezekiel is referring to that as a spirit. So whatever is, is, is giving life to the robots from his point of view is coming from the UFOs. And that's what von Daniken would say. Now, it sounds ridiculous. To us it does, certainly does. But listen, there are entire channels on cable, the history, so-called history channel, that's practically given over to that whole mindset, completely almost given over to the concept of ancient aliens. So it sounds silly to us, but it's not to other people. People pay money, good money, to have those channels come into their, house, into their houses. And guess what? The History Channel relative to ancient aliens is f it has, has a tremendous uh, viewership. I, they, a lot of people tune into that stuff, and, and you, mostly young people. So young people are very susceptible to this, and they're very vulnerable in receiving ideas like this. I know this because I did. I was 14, I was 12 years old when I started embracing this concept, and it took me over completely. I convinced other people, other kids my age, to believe this as well. I did, and that's why I had to repent, because I was preaching von Daniken, and I was doing it with passion. I believed it, right? So don't, don't, don't scoff at it. It's very real. It's very powerful and very convincing from that point of view. All right, let's read some more. Now, over the heads of the living beings, there was something like an expanse. Now, it, it, the, the 
The whole mystery of this goes even further. There was something like an expanse, like the awesome gleam of crystal spread over their heads. Now, what's that, the expanse? The word is rakia. When is the last time we saw the word rakia in the Bible in Genesis? The expanse, the rakia. God created the rakia. The rakia existed between heaven and earth. So he sees something like a rakia, like an expanse with, with, with awesome gleams, uh, uh, something like crystal spread over their heads. Wow. Under the expanse, their, wing, uh, under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, uh, one towards the other. Each, each one also had two wings covering its body on the, on, on the one side and on the other. I also heard the sound of their wings like the sound of abundant waters as they went, like the voice of the Almighty, like the voice of the Almighty, a song of, a song of tumult, like the sound of an uh, army camp. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. So there's, a, there's something like a machine sound from the standpoint of the Von Danakite. There's something like an awesome a jet engine song happening here. But this is not a jet engine. This is not an engine at all. This is the sound of God's glory. God's glory is resonating. I believe that this is what it sounds like, or part of what it sounds like, when God's glory begins to interact with creation. All right? So, so he, here, folks, what's happening? The Holy One of Israel, the God of all creation, He's breaking into creation. He's coming into creation. And, and it's an awesome thing that's happening. There, there are living creatures, cherubim, that are there to, to cover him. They cover him. They cover themselves. They are covering angels. And there's, there are noises associated with, with his appearance. Like when he appeared to Israel on Mount Sinai, there were also noises associated with his appearance. All right, now, at Mount Sinai, he came down. The entire mountain was holy. He came down. But we, we've never seen anything relative to what happened on Mount Sinai close to what Ezekiel reports. Right? Because what we're going to see here is the very being of God himself. And we're going to see it here in a few moments. Now, verse 26. Now, above the expanse that was over their heads were... <clears throat> there, there was something resembling a throne. So we talked about the glory of God, the living creatures. Now he's seeing the throne. Like lapis lazuli in appearance. What does lapis lazuli look like? Blue. Lapus, lap, excuse me. Lapis la, lazuli. It's blue. A beautiful blue. Is it um, yeah, it's a is it turquoise? No, it's a royal blue. A royal blue. That's even, that's even more fantastic. Lapis lazuli. It's a deep blue. If I can remember correctly, uh, something something close to this. No, it's brighter than that. Brighter. Yeah. All right. So lapis lazuli. Like, like this oh, okay. All right. So lapis lazuli, an expanse over his head, over the the throne. Excuse me, over the throne uh, that looked like lapis lazuli in appearance, and on that which resembles a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. Now, this figure that appears, we would believe, is in fact the Father himself. Now, it, it can be Jesus. We don't know this for sure. But I, I think, I think, without any question, that all of this incredible manifestation of glory, angels, thrones, wheels, is preparation for this one that's coming. This, this being that's about to show up. The appearance of a man. Then I noticed from the appearance of his loin and upward something like glowing metal that looked like the fire all around within it. And from the, and f and from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire and there was radiance all around him. This is an awesome being. So there's light emanating from him. There's light emanating around him, and there's something like fire. No, he's not. He, 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 Ezekiel knew what fire looked like, but he said there's something like fire. Not exactly fire. There's something like fire, and it radiated all around him. 
What we're looking at here is the Kavod Yehovah, the Kavod Elohim, the glory of God. And Ezekiel, as you see, Ezekiel is struggling. He's grappling to describe it, to give explanation to it. He's looking for references, things that he can identify with from his frame of reference to add to this incredible thing he's seeing. But what can we say about this so far? God, God's appearance in his glory is, is incredible. And associated with that, of course, like I said, is the living beings. Now, these living beings are pretty fantastic. Now, they're pretty fantastic. Wheels, within wheels. These, these beings, the spirits of these beings comes from the wheels. They don't, they don't move without the wheels. Wherever the wheels go, they go. They have four heads, four faces, I guess, not, fa not heads. A face of a man, a face of a, ra a face of a man, a face of an eagle, a face of a calf, and a face of a lion. These, these are fantastic beings. Let's read verse 28. As the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. And this is when God begins to interact with him. So he sees something like a rainbow, like the colors of a rainbow. What's he seeing? The spectrum of lights that's created when a prism is activated. So you know what a prism is, right? So if you, if, you, if, you, if you activate a prism, it will send off the colors, the spectrum of colors, the, the colors of the rainbow, what we know as the colors of the rainbow. That those colors are usually associated with water, vapor, and also power. They're, they're, they're associated with those things. Radiant, radiant power, I should say. So you have these four colors, and they're associated with God. They're all around him. They're radiating around him. I remember one time in worship, this is about a year and a half ago, maybe, maybe two years, three years ago. It's hard to tell anymore. The years just seem to run into each other. I was worshiping, I was worshiping up front in our sanctuary, and, and, and at that moment, my eyes were open. I was looking out the window, looking up into the sky, and I was just praising, worshiping God, and I said, God, show me your glory, you know, Moses. Let us, let us see your glory. And there was a plane, a jet line, an airplane, an airbus, I guess is what you would refer to them today. And it was coming over pretty fast, and it, 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 it kind of came into some clouds, and it kicked on its boosters. And I could tell it did, because all of a sudden, the clouds moved, but then there was a, a, a radiance of the spectrum colors, just all of a sudden, just real quick. And it lasted about a, maybe two or three seconds, and the plane, having its boosters uh, kicked in, took off at a higher speed. And usually when the planes come in for landing, they slow right down. This plane was, was really booking. And it was low, low enough for me to see this. And when the plane, when the boosters came on, the, the jet engine boosters came on, it must have thrown out so much heat, so much vapor, that it created this, what we call a rainbow, all around it, huge thing. And it lasted, like I said, maybe a few seconds, and it disappeared. And I, I, I just happened to be there saying, God, show, show us your glory. And there is this thing. So now I instantly knew that God had in some way uh, communicated with me. And when I, when I saw it, I went exactly to Ezekiel chapter 1. Because at the end of Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel reports that there's something like a rainbow that surrounds God's glory. Now, you, so, you, so we, we, we're looking at something that we certainly cannot describe or even define, certainly can define it. Scientists, the best the geophysicists, will not be able to define this. They will speculate, but th there are things happening here that's, that's beyond human understanding. But this is God, this is the Father himself, and his glory is also associated here with this. So what can we say about the glory of God? <laughs> The, the living creatures and the throne of God, it's absolutely awesome and amazing 
and it's way beyond our comprehension. We can't begin to even come close to understanding this, but they're associated with, with each other. Right? We, read in, we read in Revelation chapter 4, we'll read in 5 here in a few minutes, and we'll see how they are in fact associated with each other. They're very much associated with each other. Now, any questions about the, this association? This association between the glory of God, the living creatures, and the throne of God. What do you think of this? Pretty, what do you think? It's awesome. Well, he probably did, but didn't report it. I think I, I think I would be able to believe that Moses saw perhaps saw more than he reported. A human form, yeah. So that tells us that God has a human form. So Moses said, God, show me your face, and it would suffice, and it would be enough. And God said, I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to hide your face, and I'm going to pass by, and you can behold my, 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 my rear. And this is what Moses saw, and it was a form of a man. Just like Ezekiel here, there's a form of a man. Something like a, a man. So it's an awesome, awesome, uh, Ezekiel chapter 1 is an awesome chapter as it relates to this association right here that we're looking at. Why is this important? Well, it's important because it gives us a sense of what an actual cherub is. Because in, 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 in medieval art, uh, they've created for us what a cherub is. And a cherub is a little, little floating overweight baby with wings and bows and arrows and stuff. And that's not a cherub. A cherub is an awesome being. Probably gigantic. Larger than, than, than life itself. Larger than any human being. Um, so there's speculation that these cherubim are like 20, 30, 40 feet. We don't know. Maybe these cherubim can, uh, can appear in any form, any size. They're awesome beings, right? So now let's, let's make the connection between the living beings and the cherubim. Ezekiel here in Ezekiel chapter 8 now. Ezekiel chapter 1 is where his ministry begins. This is where God begins to use Ezekiel as a prophet. Then further on now in Ezekiel chapter 8, <coughs> who would like to do some reading for me? I can get over these glasses here for a moment. Ezekiel chapter 8, let's see, we want to read 1 to 4. One, one to four should be enough. It came about in the sixth year, on the fifth day of the sixth month, as I was sitting in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell on me there. Then I looked and behold, a likeness of the appearance of a man. From his loins and downward there was the appearance of fire, and from his loins and upward the appearance of brightness, like the appearance of glowing metal. He stretched out the form of a hand and caught me by lock of my head, and the spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the idol of jealousy was provoked, jealousy was located, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel, which I, which I, oh, sorry, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, like the appearance which I saw in the plain. So, he saw the glory of God, just like the appearance of what he saw when he was at the river Chiba. Now the one who came, who the awesome being himself that came and, and, and took him in a vision, we would say perhaps was in fact a pre-incarnate Jesus or a, an angel that was given the, the responsibility of taking Ezekiel in this vision to Jerusalem. At any rate, he, in this vision, he sees the glory of God again, like he did at the river Kiba. Now, Ezekiel chapter 8 is what we studied last week, where the glory of God, in this vision, left the mercy seat and went to the Mount of Olives, right? So we don't need to read all of that again. But chapter 10, we're going to see here the association between the living beings, or the living creatures, and the cherubim. 
Who would like to read 1 to 5 for us, Ezekiel chapter 10? 1 to 5. So you notice here that Ezekiel is not referring to the living creatures anymore. He's calling them cherubim. It's as if he's gained some insight as to what or who the living creatures were. And now there are actually cherubim. Same beings, same exact beings, but now they're cherubim. And the wheels are also again associated, associated with them. And the man was told to take the coals from, the, from beneath the wheels and cast them over the city of Jerusalem, indicating that Jerusalem would be, in fact, destroyed, right? And that the glory of God would depart from, from the temple. All right, let's read a little more. Who would like to read for us uh, verse 6 to 14, please? I know it's a lot of reading, but uh, we want to we wanna really grasp this. So verse 6 to 14, Ezekiel chapter 10. Cherubim appeared to have the form of a man, man's hand under their wings. And when I looked, there were four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by the cherubim and another wheel by each other cherubim. The wheels appeared to have the color of a real stone. As for the appearance, All right, that's good. That, that's enough. So all of that to really illustrate that what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 10 is exactly what he saw in chapter 1. He just gives a different, a more defined definition 
of what he saw in, in Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10. So these cherub, right, they're, wow, what's going on with them? There's just some awesome stuff going on. Uh, wheels and the, the function of the wheels to move the cherubim. Uh, but these cherubim are there to cover and to, to hover over, to cover the throne of God, where God is. Now we saw in Revelation chapter 4, the same picture, but the living beings are there and God is on his throne. The living, the living creatures, the cherubim, are there to praise God. What did it say in Revelation chapter 4? They never cease to worship and to praise him day and night forever and forever. Awesome, awesome, but they are also associated with the glory of God. So the glory of God is this light, the illumination, the different colors, the beryl, the, the lapis lazuli, all of those colors, the colors of the rainbow, all of these incredible colors and, and light. Light is energy, right? These, 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 these illuminated energies are creating the colors, the spectrums of the rainbow, what we call the, the colors of the rainbow. Uh, it's really the, the spectrum of the prism, and it's God's glory. And this is the same thing that God's going to fill us with. So when we talk about being filled with the glory of God, we don't even have a clue the incredible, the incredible thing that will happen when God fills us with his glory. Because this is his glory. Ezekiel said it's like fire. It's radiant. It's like fire. It's not really fire. It's glory. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 5 again. Now we read chapter 4. Now we're going to read Revelation chapter 5. Maybe I can help out and do some reading for you guys at this point. We're going to read all of Revelation chapter 5. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. These are the seals that Yeshua will break, and in breaking these seals, he will initiate judgment. Uh, judgment upon humanity, up upon creation. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look in it, look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping, behold, the lion. That is, that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. So John is there. He's, there there's, a, there's, a, there's a request for someone to be worthy to open this book, to begin the process of God's judgment. No one is found worthy. He is weeping. One of the angels says, don't do it. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, right, who is Yeshua, he is able to do it. He is worthy. And I saw, <clears throat> I saw between the thrones with the four living creatures, the cherubim again, and the elders, a lamb. Who is the lamb? Jesus. Standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, and, uh, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. So this lamb, now this is figurative, of course, it's not literal. Uh, this lamb has what? Seven? Seven eyes. Seven eyes, which are the seven spirits that goes out in Revelation chapter 1. Jesus speaks about the, the, the candle stand being the, the, the spirits, the seven spirits. And it came, <coughs> excuse me, and he came and took the book out of the hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and a golden bowl of, a golden bowls full of censer, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. So the lamb is the one who takes the book and is worthy, 
has been found worthy to break its seals. And again, the cherubim and the, the elders, the living creatures, the cherubim and the elders are worshiping the lamb. Right, so we talk about, we talk about the difference, or we differentiate between the Father and the Son, but the Son is divine because in heaven they're worshiping him. The elders and the living beings, the cherub, are worshiping the lamb in heaven. Now, there are many, many movements that stemmed from the Messianic movement. The Messianic movement has been around since 1974, about. And it has gone through many revolutions, many changes, many adaptations. I would say even many evolutions. It's, ev it's evolved into other things. And about mm, 10, 20 years ago, I think maybe 15 years ago, there was a, a movement within the movement of the Messianic movement of, of believers, most of them Hispanic, uh, at least here in Tong. And they were basically saying, we've come to God through Jesus. We don't need Jesus or we don't need to worship Jesus, Yeshua, anymore because he has led us to God himself. So why are we worshiping and praising Yeshua? And that, that movement existed here in this church, and they were a good contingency of people, uh, four or five families. And they were strong. They were, they were using their influence to try and maneuver the church and influence the church in that direction, that we need to stay away from the worship of Yeshua, need, need not worship him anymore because he's led us to the Father. Well, I was one of the people that stood up against it. And I, I got some black eyes and some punches to the throat and so on, figuratively speaking. But I couldn't see myself being part of a church where Jesus was not worshipped, based on this. And not only this, of course, the disciples of Yeshua worshipped him after the cross. And he allowed it. They, in the book of Luke, it says they all fell and they worshipped him. In his pre-incarnated form, incarnated form, excuse me. So why would we not worship him? If he and the Father is one, and he's at the right hand of God, to worship the Father is to worship him. And that's exactly what we're seeing here in Revelation chapter 5. The, the elders and the, the angels are worshiping him. So unfortunately, those people who were wanting the church to stray or to go away from worshiping Jesus... Uh, they, they got upset and they took off. They realized that we were not going to succumb and they took off. Yeah. So they had to go. <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't be a part of us. All right, so let's read that again. Verse 6. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders and a lamb, lamb standing, as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into the earth. And he came, and he took the book out of the hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped, fell down before the lamb, each one having a harp. And so we read all of this. And they said that he was worthy because he had purchased for God with his blood, a kingdom of priests. And where would this kingdom of priests reign? In the earth. So one of the things that Christianity has failed to do is to recognize Christianity as a priesthood. And what Orthodox Christianity has done is they've created a priesthood within the priesthood. In other words, in the Orthodox Church you have priests. And they are clergy. They are, for all practical purposes, above the laity. The laity are not priests. You're not, you're not expected to be considered priests. Don't consider yourself a priest. Because we have priests. They've studied. They've been set apart. They've consecrated their lives to this priesthood. They are priests. You are not. Right? In most cases, the priests are male. Cannot be female. In the Catholic Church, you cannot be a female priest. I think in the Episcopalian Church, you can be a female priest. Well, this is all nonsense. Because Jesus purchased with his blood 
people, man, woman, people from every tribe, nation, kingdom, to become a nation of priests. We are a nation of priests. Each one of us in Messiah, we are priests. Now, this is not the only place that reflects that in the Bible. Peter speaks about it very clearly. In Revelation chapter 1, it states it there again very clearly. Revelation chapter 20, again, we are priests. We are a priesthood. Where will we reign? Off in heaven somewhere? No, we will reign as priests in the earth. A kingdom and priests. We will reign in the earth. All right? and that, that, puts, that puts the, uh, the, the, pre, the, the post-tribulation kingdom here on earth. We're talking about the millennial kingdom. We're going to function as priests here on planet earth. Which is amazing. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. So take me off to heaven somewhere, but actually heaven is consummated with earth in Jerusalem. Heaven becomes earth in Jerusalem. That's where we're going. So let's read 11 to 14. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around, and the, and the, and around the throne, and the living creatures, again, the cherubim and the elders, and the number of them were... The number of them was myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessings. And every, every created thing which, which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne... And to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. So again, they're worshipping the Lamb and Him who sits on the throne. This union between Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, and God Himself. So the being that Ezekiel saw was the Father Himself, we would say. The Father has the Son, Yeshua. Firstborn of all creation, incarnated as a human, offered himself up as, as a sacrifice, an approach on behalf of God's atonement for all sin. He resurrects, he comes before the throne of God, he's found worthy, and he's placed at, at God's right hand. Isn't that, isn't that a wonderful, wonderful uh, narrative, a story, a beautiful picture of redemption? That the one who was slain from the foundation of the world, who is Yeshua, carried it out 2,000 years ago, according to Peter, for us all to see, and then resurrected the first fruits, a picture of what, will, what we will experience. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He was the first fruits of the rest of us that will be a greater harvest of the first fruits, the greater resurrection. And he reigns at God's right hand, and when we resurrect, that's precisely where we're going. To reign along with Yeshua at the right hand of God. And that will manifest at, at that time. That will manifest in Jerusalem. And so the idea is that in Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom, the glory of God, this incredible thing, will be there. But Yeshua himself will represent the presence of God, the throne of God. In other words, God himself will continue to, to reign in heaven, where that is. God will continue to reign in heaven. Yeshua will be here on earth, representing him here on earth. He will be the picture of God himself here together with us. And we, like I said last week, would be the vessel, the container of God's glory. We will contain the glory of God. And Yeshua will be in our midst. And so the, all the nations will have a picture of God when they come up to Jerusalem and behold us. When they look upon us, Yeshua in our midst, they will see God. That's, 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 that's what's before us. That's what's before us. When we resurrect, you know, Pastor Ken used to say, not when the rapture, but why the rapture? Why does this rapture occur? Why do we transform? And that was his question. 
And, and the answer is we transform in order to become something unhuman, unnatural, supernatural, supernatural beings that will become the residents of God's glory. God will abide in us. And so before we, we bring this part of the class to an end, we have five more minutes, let's, let's read about this new creation body that Paul spoke about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is sort of a, an iconic chapter in, in regards to the resurrection, first fruits. So in 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 15, I'll read for you 20 to 23 at first. Come on, glasses, don't fail me. All right, but now, in verse 20, but now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. So Messiah, his resurrection, represents the first fruits of every other Christian who will live and die. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, so also in Messiah all will be made alive. But each in his own, each in his own order, Messiah, the first fruits, after, after that those who are Messiahs at his coming. So, first fruits. The first fruit, the first fruit of Messiah came to bear when he was resurrected. Our first fruits will come to bear when we resurrect. And what we resurrect into is what we're going to look at now. The new creation body. And let's read, let's, let's take a look at this. Paul has quite a bit to say about this, so we'll, we'll do some reading. We've got five minutes, we can do it. Verse 35 and onwards. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool, he's rebuking someone in this church. Uh, probably based on a question or an issue that came up. He says, you fool, that which you sow does not come into life unless it dies. And that which, and, and that which you sow, you do not sow the body which, which, which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it, God gives it a body just as he wishes, and to each of and to each of the seeds a body of its own. So he's basically making the point, he's making an analogy between a seed, a grain, and, and the human body. Right? The grain doesn't know what it's, what it's going to, 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 to become, but it becomes by, by God's design. Like earlier tonight, I, uh, someone left some popcorn here. And I don't normally eat popcorn, but for some reason tonight I felt like I would put some popcorn on. So I put a little bag in the microwave. I put it on for a minute according to the instructions and half of the bag popped. So I took it out, I looked at it, shook it around, it's got seeds all in, green. And so I popped it back in the microwave, I turned it on for another minute and then the bag fluffed out completely and all of the popcorn, all of the greens had popped, right? And so you have this concept of a green popping, exploding into something Completely different. It goes from a little crusty, amber-looking seed to a fluffy white popcorn. And that's, that's kind of what Paul is saying. We, we're going to be like popcorn, I guess. And the heat that's going to be applied is the glory of God as we resurrect and as we, as we do. This, this seed, this green becomes popcorn. What can I tell you? <laughs> Hopefully caramel uh, uh, added to it. So all, <clears throat> all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of man, another flesh of beast, another flesh of birds, another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly one, the glory, the glory of the heavenly is one, the glory of the earthly is another. There is, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differ from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. 
it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-given spirit. So it's the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God, working in our little grainy bodies that will cause us to transform and to, and to become the new creation form. Paul has a few more things to say about it, but I think we get the, we get the idea. It is sown in dishonor. You know, if, if God is gracious to me, I will die of old age. And hopefully not too painfully, but I'll die of old age. Even if I die of some sickness, it's going to be sown in dishonor. In other words, this body is a dishonorable body compared to what is to come. It's going to be sown and it's going to be, and in the harvest, so to speak, it's going to be glorious. It's going to be a body of God's glory. And the idea is that it's going to resurrect in a form that will be e effectively a crucible, a container for the glory of God. And it's going to hold the glory of God. Last week we talked about the fireflies, remember? And these fireflies are fascinating creations. They're created, they're created in such a way as to illuminate. Well, that's sort of who we're going to be. We're going to be little popcorn fireflies. Illuminating God's glory. Right? So, let's go get some popcorn. We'll come back at uh, quarter after and continue. Over the, over the millennia, the church's treatment of the book of Revelation has been that you're unable as a lay person to really understand the book of Revelation. Uh, and it's not really something that we can understand actually. And they've given different ideas about how to interpret the book of Revelation. We'll talk about that as we go forward. But in the book of Revelation, we see the, the, the reality, the concept of the mark of the beast, what's referred to as the mark of the beast. It's found in Revelation chapter 13. And let's take a look at that as it appears in Revelation chapter 13. Now, we're not going to get too far afield into the book of Revelation tonight, of course, but we just want to take a look at this concept of the mark of the beast. Of course, you know, a lot has been said about the mark of the beast, a lot of opinions about the mark of the beast. So in Revelation chapter, chapter 13, I'm going to read verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate or determine, calculate, figure out, the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666, 666. Now in the Bible, six is the number that's relegated to man, okay? Uh, man was given to work six days and rest on the seventh day. Six is the number, and I, I don't get into numer biblical numerology much, but Six is always associated with man. Seven is God's number. Six is man's number. At any rate, so it is a number of a man, or it is the number of man. 666, the mark of the beast. And so over the years, over the millennia, actually, there have been all sorts of ideas about what the mark of the beast is, what it might be, what it can possibly represent. So I'm going to give a, a point of view about the mark of the beast tonight. We find the text that we're going to look at to validate what I'm going to tell you is in, is in Ezekiel chapter 9. So we're going to read the text in Ezekiel chapter 9. And, and that's going to give us the basis or, or, or foundation for understanding of what the mark of the beast might be. Now anyone that tells you that they know for sure, for sure, for sure what the mark of the beast is, they're not being truthful, because no one knows for sure, for sure, for sure what the mark of the beast is. Now, <clears throat> when, when, the, when, the book of, when the book of Revelation, included in the canon of the Bible, was released into the populace of the population of Europe after the Reformation, you know what happened with the Reformation, right? 
The Reformation released the Word of God into the Christian communities of Europe. And of course, the Christian communities before the Reformation were predominantly Roman Catholic. There were small movements of breakaway churches uh, before the Reformation, but they didn't fare very well under the crushing hand of the Vatican. But eventually came the Reformation where vast numbers of believers escaped the confines, uh, the confinement of the Roman Catholic institution, and the Bible became proliferated in Europe. And then the book of Revelation became one of those books that were difficult for the early reformists to try and understand and figure, figure out. So all kinds of ideas were given to what the mark of the beast may have been. Uh, there was a time, three, four hundred years ago, that the mark of the beast would be a tattoo of some sort that would be placed on your right hand and on your forehead. Why a tattoo at that time? Because at that time, that was sort of the technology of the time. A mark, a tattoo, uh, an inscri and something inscribed. Or they also thought that it would be sort of a brand, like you would be branded <coughs> with this mark on your forehead and on your hands. And today we kind of reject that off the cuff, don't we? Uh, we even reject the notion of the mark of the beast being a tattoo. I mean, everybody's getting tattoos, right? And so the idea that the mark of the beast would be a tattoo just doesn't make sense. Uh, the idea of it being a brand also today is sort of, that's, that's put, who's going to brand us, right? Who's going to line us up like cattle and put brands on our forehead and our hands? And so, well, and, and this, this, is, this is, was determined to be the mark of the beast for a long time. And then came modern technology, right? And so in the, 19, in the 1970s and 1980s, the mark of the beast became barcodes. So suddenly the mark was no longer a branding or a tattoo. It became barcodes because barcodes can contain a lot of information and you can, you can, simp you can, you can, you can apply it to someone's head. So the idea, of the, the idea was in the 70s that they would put bar barcodes on our heads and our hands and we'd be walking around with barcodes. You know, they would scan us and to tell if we have the mark of the beast or not. Then came the 1990s, where it became not, not any longer a barcode, but a chip. The chip was about a half an inch square, according to what was being said then. And so the government, this new world order system, the beast is going to just capture everyone and give everyone a chip. These chips are going to be placed under your skin, on your forehead, and on your hand, about a half an inch square. And then technology developed even further, and then the chip became the size of a rice grain, a little bigger than a rice grain. So then what's happening now? It's, down, it's being downsized. You know, micro technology comes in. Now it's a rice grain that will be placed in your forehead and on your hands. And now technology has gone much, much further since then. Micro, micro technology. Now the chip is the size of a, the, the pinhead, right? Just, just smaller than a pinhead, just larger than a pinhead. So, so we went from a, from a tattoo, a branding, to a barcode, to a half an, half an inch, half an inch chip, to a pinhead. Who knows where it's going to go next, right? So we keep, we keep hearing about these, these uh, marks of the beast. And with all these things, you can't survive, and, and so on. All right, so uh, perhaps it's true. I, I don't know. Perhaps there's going to be some sort of a chip computer chip or something that will be placed in us and, and you know they'll scan us at the grocery perhaps it'll be so advanced that we won't be able to go anywhere without this approval without this chip on our head and our hands we won't be able to fly we won't be able to enter into a bank or any any so really that's all kind of speculative it's, it's based on what we see in the book of revelation chapter 13 as it relates to they won't be able to buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast. All right, what I want to present to you tonight is that the mark of the beast is possibly spiritual, not physical. It is not an object, something that you place in someone's head or on someone's hand. I'm going to present to you that it is more so to do with the heart than it has to do with the physical being. 
And let's read here now, Ezekiel chapter 9. <coughs> now remember, this, remember that in Ezekiel chapter 8, he's taken, he's taken by a lock of his hair in the spirit, taken into Jerusalem in the spirit where he's having visions. Now in, in chapter 9, then he cried out in my hearing with a loud voice saying, Draw near, O executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. God is preparing to destroy Jerusalem. Behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a shattering weapon in his hand. And among them was a certain man clothed in linen with a writing case in his loins. At his loins, excuse me. And they went... They went in and stood before the bronze altar. Then the glory of the God of Israel went up from the cherubim on which it had been, on which it had been, to the threshing, to the threshold, excuse me, of the temple, and he called out he called to the man clothed in the linen, at whose loins was the writing case. The Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of all the men who sigh and groan over their, their abominations, which are being committed in its midst. So here is Jerusalem, a city that is overcome by sin. It's, scheduled, it's slated for destruction. God is going to, God is going to destroy Jerusalem. He, 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 he commissions an, an angelic being to go through the city and put a mark on the foreheads of the people that are not sorrowful, or in fact, excuse me, that are not, that are sorrowful over, this, over the condition of Jerusalem. So if you're in Jerusalem and you're, you're, you have the heart of God and you're not rejoicing over the situation in Jerusalem, in other words, your heart is contrite, you're broken over the sinful condition of Jerusalem, you'll get a mark put on your forehead. Now that mark is invisible, right? It's spiritual. It's something that's happening in the spirit realm. So it, it, it is a mark, and the mark is there to mark that these people are not slated for destruction. They will not be destroyed, the ones who are mourning over the condition of Jerusalem. So we see here from that reference that the mark is spiritual. It's not physical. It has to do with, it, with where their hearts were. What were they giving their hearts to? What were they giving their, their allegiance to? Right. Now, you take that as a model for, for, for interpretation of Revelation chapter 13, and how can that apply to the mark of the beast? God, in other words, God has a mark, and his mark goes upon those who are in alignment with him. In Revelation chapter 8 as well, or, or 9, we see that that, that that same mark will be placed on the foreheads of the 144,000 Jews who will, who will be saved from the destruction in Jerusalem. The mark of God will be upon their foreheads. So God has a mark that he puts upon the foreheads of those whose hearts are given over to him. I would venture to say that each of us in this room, we have the mark of God. We do. Because is there any one of us here that's rejoicing over the sinful condition of God's creation, of man, humanity? Is there any one of us that's rejoicing that abortions are proliferating more and more? <coughs> How many of us are grieved over the condition of society? Homosexuality becoming trendy, fashionable. It grieves me. How many, of, how many of us are grieved over abortions? How many of us here in this room tonight are grieved over the evil one and all that he attempts to do and all that he's succeeding to do in society? If you do, you have the mark of God upon your forehead. Now let's talk about the mark of the beast. Now if that mark is, is sort of the prototype for marks, let's talk about the mark of the beast. If, if I am grieving over the condition of sinful humanity, and that gives me God's mark, what will be the mark of the devil? 
the mark of the beast. If you embrace the, 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 the destruction that's occurring, if you not only embrace it, you internalize it, you, you accept it, you, you take it into your, your, your being, but then there's also the mark of the beast that goes on the hand. And what is that symbolic of? We're talking about symbolisms here. The mark of the beast on the forehead, just as the mark of God on the forehead of those who are in alignment with God, the, those who are in alignment with the beast, with Satan's symbol, with, with Satan's kingdom, will have his mark on their foreheads. But then the mark of the beast is also on the hand. What is that symbolic of? It's symbolic of those who will work towards, those who will apply their strength, that's why it's on the right hand, towards Satan's kingdom. And that is the mark of the beast. It's spiritual, it's not necessarily physical. Now, there are many chips that are being designed. They're putting chips in babies. They're putting chips in dogs. And, 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 and eventually, human beings will be, will be uh, led towards putting chips in our hands for the same reason. But, but I, think, I think we ought to be sensible here and not run off with the notion that the chip is certainly the mark of the beast. It's, it's, it's not. A chip cannot render me evil. Right? How many chips do I have on me right now? How many chips do I have on my, on my head right now? You see, so it, you, have to be, you have to be sensible about these things. No, a chip doesn't render someone having the mark of the beast. All right? A chip, you put a chip in my forehand, and I realize, wow, this, is, this chip is the reason I'm going to hell. Well, I'll take a pen knife and dig it out. It's that simple. Oh, but you won't be able to buy and sell. Okay, <laughs> buy and sell. The chip, it's, it's, it's not physical. It's where your heart is. And it's amazing to me because in Revelation chapter 8, I believe it's 8 or 9, it talks about, it talks about those who take, who, those who will receive God's mark. And it's the exact same word that's used in the Greek for the mark of the beast. So you have God's mark found in Ezekiel chapter 8, in Revelation chapter 9, but then you have the mark of the beast, those who will commit their, their beings to Satan's kingdom and actually work towards it, give their strength towards it. Yes? Yes? There'll be sanctions, yeah. This will happen, yes, bef certainly before the rapture. So we're going to suffer before the rapture. How many Christians are suffering right now? No, I, I mean, continent of Africa, the continent of Africa, you got millions of Christians that are being butchered regularly. That's tribulation. That's, that's suffering, as we, as we would say in Trinidad. China, how many Chinese Christians are suffering? So we in the West, we have this Western privileged Christianity mentality that we're not going to see any, any suffering. Because why? Because we're Western Christians. We're privileged. Well, I think we need to wake up from that fallacy because we're going to experience the same difficulties that the rest of the Christian world is experiencing. So yes, we're going to go through difficulty. Well, this is, this is pre-rapture for sure. The rapture, now, what you're going to, if you, you stay with the course and study through, you're going to see that the rapture will occur, not in Revelation chapter 4, when John is taken up to heaven um, in a vision. It's going to occur in Revelation chapter 11. That's, that's where it happens, and you'll see it yourself. Um, so, so, yeah, the mark of the beast comes before the rapture. It just, it just does. And so, but there comes a time when, now, no. if, if those who had the mark of the beast were the ones that were destined for hell, those who didn't have the mark of the beast were the Christians that were destined for heaven, then of course it's happening before the rapture. You see. 144,000 Jews, 12,000 of each tribe, that will have God's mark on their foreheads. All right, that doesn't mention... Christians at all in, in, that, in that context. 
It talks about Jews who will have God's mark. And this, and this, of course, will lead up to that point where everyone who has the mark of the beast will be slated for judgment, and those who do not, not just the ones with the mark of God on their foreheads, and those who do not have the mark of the beast will go through a difficult time, difficult period, uh, but then comes the end when Jesus comes and he will take everyone who's taken the mark of the beast and the beast and the false prophet, he will cast them into the lake of fire. So the mark being spiritual in that, in that sense is not something that's necessarily seen, visible or, or tangible. It's something that conditions that our heart conditions uh, are given over to. And, and, and most of the world will take the mark of the beast. Now, we have, we have the beast there, the mark of the beast being uh, 666, right? Now, 6 is man's number throughout the Bible. What do we know about the beast? The beast of Revelation chapter 13, the beast, the beast uh, kingdom of Daniel chapter 7. It's going to be an entirely global kingdom. It's going to be a kingdom that will encompass the entire world. This is the same kingdom, Babylon, that the angel in Revelation chapter 18 is going to cry out for the saints to come out of her. Not to be raptured out of her, but to come out, to separate yourselves away from, 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 from Babylon and don't partake in her judgment. Now, if, if the saints were not on the earth, there would be no reason for the angel to say such a thing. But in Revelation chapter 18, the angel cries out and says, Come out of her, my people. Don't be a part of her judgment. To make yourself separate from the beast. So this beast <coughs> is definitely slated for judgment, slated for destruction. God's going to destroy this Babylon, right? And he's been storing up for a long time. He's been storing wrath for this Babylon for a very long time. And when he brings judgment, the retribution will go all the way back to Nimrod's Babel. That, that he's going to judge this Babel like he's judging Nimrod, Nimrod's kingdom. That's how far back he's been storing up judgment. But the mark of the beast, so, so let's put it in context. When this whole thing begins to unfold in the earth, and the beast government takes its place in the earth, and begins to make demands upon Christians, you know, <clears throat> you have uh, democratic candidates running for presidency now that are spouting a lot of very bold things that churches will not be able to support Israel anymore. If you're pro-life, you're not going to have your tax status. And, and Beto and some of these other candidates are just spouting really, really dangerous words. Words of, 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 of totalita totalitarianism. Words of the beast. That they're speaking for the beast, actually, the world system. Now, I know without any question that just about every one member, with perhaps the exception of one uh, candidate for the Demo Democratic presidency position, is given over completely to the world system, given over completely to the beast, the new world order, all with the exception of one, perhaps. And that's, uh, what's her name? Kelsey Gabbard or Gathered or whatever her name is. Kelsey. Yeah. She is perhaps the only one that isn't sold out or, or bought, purchased by the New World Order. The rest of them are. You listen to what they're saying, and they are speaking on behalf of the United Nations. They are speaking on behalf of the United Nations Agenda 21, and all of the other agendas that goes along with it. So eventually, someone's going to get into the White House, and they're going to successfully hand this country over to that system. It's going to happen. It's only a matter of time. And when they do, I think at that point is when we're going to begin to see just the complete magnification of this world system, this government. And at some point, they're going to begin to put pressure on people like us. <coughs> they, they'll put tremendous pressure on us. They will find some way to tag us, for sure, to keep us in, 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 in corral, keep us in line, be it a mark or something like that. But to be frank with you, a chip or something like that. To be frank with you, you, you force me to take a chip, well, what's going to stop me from getting the chip off of me? You, you understand me? So it's got to be more than a chip. It's got to be much, much more than a chip. You say, okay, if you, if you meddle with the chip, it's going to explode into 
into a, a, a micro-nuclear explosion, you'll die. Okay, well, then I'll die if it's that simple. But it's not that simple. It's where the heart is. It's where your heart is. And people like us will not fall into alignment with the world system. Now, here's the problem. Many people, many Christians, will be deceived to fall into it and to accept it. Even the pre-tribulationists who are looking for a chip, right? And suddenly there's really no chip, but there's something completely different and unexpected, which is a heart agreement, uh, 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 an alliance, an allegiance, I should say, with the system. So it's conceivable that Christians can buy into the system and form an allegiance with the system, taking the true mark of the beast, but never having a chip ever. Because the mark of the beast comes from here. And then, of course, you work towards it. I see all of these very, uh, very ideological, social justice warrior types. And they call up here. They give us a hard time about our involvement with Act for America and so on. And, and they're very passionate about this. These young people, uh, many of them, most of them Democrats and liberal, they are prime candidates for the, for the world system. They are prime candidates for the new world order. It's, it was inconceivable 40 years ago, 20 years ago, that a government can come upon the scene that can motivate people towards uh, sort of a Nazi movement. What happened with the Nazis, right? <clears throat> what happened with the Nazis? A government came into, into being, incredibly deceptive, incredibly influential, with a very charismatic leader who, who was socialist, socialist, became fascist after a few decades, two decades, it became a fascist movement, and then leads the entire country towards doing what they did, destroying their own citizens, turning against the entire world. How is that even possible? But it happened. It's not inconceivable that something like that can happen here, but on a much larger scale. Hitler and the Nazis motivated the youth in Germany to, 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 be, to, be, to be energized against the Jews of, of Germany, to be energized against the entire world. Well, I'm seeing the same thing happening now. This movement called Antifa. Antifa is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, the tip of the sword. Antifa is very much like the Nazis. Very, very much like the Nazis because they're socialist. They're social justice warriors, each of them. They're socialist and they're also fascist. What defines a fascist? Well, someone who is determined to use any means possible to get you to believe the way do they the, the way the way do the way they believe. And they would, they, would, they would resort to violence, and that's what Antifa is doing. They, they resort to violence, compulsion, physical confrontation, any means to get you to believe the way they do. And that's basically what the Nazis did. So I can see, and it's not far off perhaps, a time when uh, this system, this, this, this juggernaut of world government, this beast, will come into power and motivate millions and millions of young Americans to deal with the biggest problem that this country faces, which is people like me and you. We are, and becoming more so, the fly in the ointment, the impediment to their government, to their utopia, we are where we are. Why? Because right now we're Trump voters. We're Trump, make America great again, we're Trump voters. We're voting for that Trump. But it's not really about Trump. It's about the ideology that we hold to. You listen to these people, and they, des they despise Vice President Pence. They despise him. Why? Because he's a Christian. His wife teaches at a Christian school. And that really, that's really where it comes down to. They don't hate Trump necessarily. They hate him, but he's just a figurehead of what they really hate. They hate me and you with a passion. They hate us. Right. They hate us with a passion. We're conservative, we're deplorables, we're, you know, Russian assets, whatever they want to call us. So, that's, you're seeing the beginnings of a movement that will ultimately 
separate us from the rest of the world that will take the mark of the beast and we would be automatically separated you know they don't need a chip to know who we are they don't need a chip they know who we are they can identify us without the chip they can sanction our lives without a chip folks I mean, let's be let's be let's be sensible if you take the idea of technology developing that and you, you apply that to the mark of the beast, okay, so 25 years ago, for them to have uh, uh, governance over our lives, they would, ha they would have to have a computer chip in us. That was 25 years ago. And now, they monitor now they don't need an actual chip. They can do it from space. And there's no need for a chip. Right. Who, who you are aligned with, uh, you, social media, for instance. They know more about, about every citizen in this country than ever before through social media. How many people has a Twitter account? How many people has a Facebook account? How many people has a driver's license, a social, secu a social se security card? Passports. Passports. So th they don't need a literal chip anymore. They can monitor you and censor your life, censor your life without any of that. So the mark of the beast, I believe, is more spiritual than it is literal or physical. Now, it, there very well might be something they will force us to wear or something. I, I won't say no to it. But I would tell you that the intentions of this world system for the deplorables like us are not good. And this is not just some revelation that I've stumbled on doing research on Google over the last... 10 years or so, it was 1991 when I heard an interview done by Marlon Mattox. I don't know if you know who Marlon Mattox was or is. Marlon Mattox. You remember Marlon Mattox. Had a radio show. He was a conservative to radio talk show host, and he would interview you know, particularly controversial guests uh, in, in regards to the New World Order, because this is, this is 1991 now. And he had a program where he interviewed someone who came away from the United Nations, someone who was, who was at a very high position in the UN, became born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and left the UN and began to expose the UN for what the UN actually was, 1991. And Marlon Mattox had this person on their pro a woman on his program, and she was just exposing all of the, all of the schemes, all of the agendas, of the UN as it relates to people like us. And I don't want to shock you, but they have really bad intentions towards us. Really bad intentions. And it's, it's, it's really a depressing thing, and if you allow, if, if, if you really get into it, it can, it can shake you what the, their plans are for us. But their plans are worse than what Hitler had planned for the Jewish people. It's much broader, it's much more efficient, it's much more well-planned. And they have a plan. And they're just waiting for the right opportunity to implement it. Now, I personally believe that Hillary Clinton was that instrument that would have, that would have began this process. I, I am so convinced of it. The question is, why did God intervene so profoundly with Donald Trump? Why did, he, why did he drive that wedge in there to stop them? Because I am convinced that Hillary Clinton was that instrument that would have began the process that the UN has been planning for for decades, which is to deal with people like us. And I say it for many reasons. I have a spiritual discernment about it. And it's also very, very practical as well. Remember the elections of... Uh, of 2016. She was absolutely convinced that she was going to win, right? Mm -hmm. The elections of, 20, of uh, 2008, all right, 2008, what happened? She was in the lead. Barack Obama was sort of an upstart, and he wasn't in the lead, but she was. <coughs> and McCain was running against, they were running against McCain. All of a sudden, they go to a, a Bilderberger meeting in, in, in uh, Toronto, it was, it was actually, uh, it was in 2007 when they went to the Bilderberg meeting. It was October of 2007. 
They go to the Bilderberger meeting. I said they, I mean Hillary and Obama. They were both filmed going into the meeting in limousines. It was a, it was a, a weekend seminar type meeting, Bilderberg meeting. And you know who the Bilderbergs are? You don't know who the Bilderbergs are? Okay, well, you need to do some research on that. The, Bilderberg, the Bilderbergers, as they're they referred to, the Bilderbergers is a globalist movement consisting of the most elite of the elite, elite in government. Uh, I'm talking about royalty, royal families, and so on. Uh, the business elite, the political elite, uh, they consist of, of the Bilderberger society. They are, they are globalists of the worst kind. <laughs> They, they, they've been meeting secretly around the world for the last 30, 40 years. I think since World War II, actually. So 60, 65 years. They've been meeting annually around the world. It's been a secret until about 25 years ago. People like Marlon Mattox and others began to expose the Bilderberg Society and expose them for who they are. So they began to expose who the members of the Bilderberg Society was and what their agendas were. And so about 25 years ago, it's, it, it ceased to be a secret who the Bilderbergers were and what they were up to. So then it became almost public knowledge, and you can find the information on them really easy in the Internet. So every year they had at a different location this, this secret meeting where the, the elite of the elite, the creme de la creme, the movers and shakers of planet Earth will meet and plot the, the destiny of humanity, which is what they do. So Hillary and Obama was filmed going into that hotel in, in Toronto and coming away from there almost immediately. Barack Obama began to surge. Hillary began to bumble and stumble and she retreated. I believe, as many believed, that it was at the Bilderberg meeting in 2007, it was determined that Barack will run, will, will, will become president, Hillary, you will, you will give way to him, you will concede to him, but then your turn will come in 2016. I am convinced of it, absolutely convinced of it. And it was going to happen. It seemed to be an unstoppable event, a freight train, but it wasn't. God had another plan. He raised up this loudmouth, crazy, narcissistic uh, blowhard named Donald Trump. And God duped the entire, God did it. He duped the entire establishment. Because once they saw that Donald Trump was running, they said, ah, we got to support him because he's for sure going to lose. CNN was all about Donald Trump when they, when they knew that he was going to run. He was going to run against viable candidates, Ted Cruz and others. And they were afraid of Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz horrified them. And so they, ah, Donald Trump, and so CNN, MSNBC, they were all, Trump, 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 we want Trump to run. And then when he became the candidate, they were all ecstatic. When he became the front runner, they were all ecstatic. He's easy to beat. And our little plan, it worked. We got him. But it was God who placed him there. God pulled the wool over the eyes of the DNC, the media, and Hollywood. And suddenly he becomes president, stops Hillary Clinton, the new world order, in their tracks. Remember in 2016, towards the end of the, her campaign, she began to dress in a very peculiar way. Remember? How did she begin to dress? She began to wear outfits that were very reminiscent of communist China. Mao Zedong type, type outfits. Over and over, she kept wearing these really strange, communist-looking outfits. She was making a statement. She was, she was projecting. You know, something, this is, this is, and you can research me on this. There's a known fact, but not known by many people, but there's a known fact that in the occult, in these secret societies, you're committed to project what you're up to. You have to project it. Even though cryptic, you know, hidden, you must project what you're up to. And she was projecting it. They were projecting it. They were basically saying, get ready. Something much worse than China is coming. That's, I, I'm convinced that's what they were saying. The night of the elections, everybody on her staff was wearing purple. Remember that? Yeah. Witchcraft. And it, it symbolizes something in witchcraft. 
It symbolizes victory and power in witchcraft. And on the night of the elections, they were all wearing these purple ties and purple dresses and purple accessories. Black and purple together. And so there you have it, folks. Right, yeah. They were convinced that Hillary was a shoe in and that they would have their time to bring about the age of Aquarius. And that sounds silly, doesn't it? You know, the age of Aquarius. No, it's deadly serious because according to what these people believe, the age of Aquarius is when the, the spirits and the spirit realm and the demons are, are in control. They were working on bringing about this final, final age of this beast government. Have they stopped? Did they change their mind, their minds because of Trump? Of course not. What are, they, what are they doing about Trump right now? They're losing their marbles over Trump. They're doing everything in their power to stop him. Why are they so vehement about this? Because they know what's at stake. Because they want to lose the world. Yeah. They know what's at stake. Their new world order is at stake. And they're losing their marbles over it. This new world order, this world system that's being worked on, has been worked on for decades, is ultimately going to become the beast of Revelation chapter 13, the world government, and the beast of, Re of Daniel chapter 7, a world system that will encompass the, ent the entire world. God saw it, and God gave that vision to Daniel. And Daniel saw it as the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7, a beast unlike anything he's ever seen. He inquired of the, of the angel, what is the story with this beast, Daniel said to the angel. The angel said, you don't know what this is about? He said, the fourth beast will be a fourth empire, a kingdom upon the earth that will crush and subdue the entire world. And that's what's distinctive about the fourth beast. This is the world system. Many people are already, have already taken the mark of the beast. Each one of these kids out on the streets supporting Antifa, they're, they're showing their mark. They're, they're showing to everyone that they've taken the mark of the beast. CNN, MSNBC, Hollywood, the DNC, they've all taken the mark of the beast. And it's, a very, it's very much a hierarchical system. It's very much a hierarchical system. It's very much like what we see in the occultic movements, like in the Freemason. It's, it's formed in, a, in the form of a pyramid, and you have to ascend it. The higher you get up on this pyramid, is the, high, the closer you get to that place of absolute illumination. Absolute illumination. It's, it's Luciferianism, folks. It is Luciferianism on its, on its most exalted level. And that's what we have today. That's what we're facing down today. And this world system is already in place. It's formed. It's going to actuate fully at some point in the future, maybe after Trump. At some point, God is going to say, the time has come, let it go. At some point, he's going to do it. And it's going to happen. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be hor horrific ugly. About 10 years ago, I began to see articles coming up talking about guillotines being made, that our government were manufacturing actual function and working guillotines. And I said, that's nonsense. That can never be. How can that be? Who will, who will manufacture guillotines for, the go for, for our government? So I dug into it. I looked into it. And I saw, wow, it's valid. I still didn't believe it. I kept digging. I kept looking. And it's absolutely true. 30,000 guillotines have been produced by a company here in this, in this, in this, in this country. And they're functioning guillotines. They're, right now, they're stored away somewhere in the country. But they're there, 30,000 of them, functioning guillotines. Why is our government uh, contracting to have guillotines made? What's that about? Well, we don't have to, I don't have to extrapolate for you. You can, you, can, you can understand what they're up to. Right? Book of Revelation talks about the beheading of the saints. Right, that, there's that chapter in the book of Revelation, that text in the book of Revelation, where the saints are crying out, the ones who have been beheaded. They're crying out for justice. That's part of the tribulation. It's part of that process of tribulation. 
Now, if you, if you ask me, what, what would you choose? Would you choose beheading? Or would you choose to turn your back on Jesus? Okay. If you put me, if you put me in, a, in, a, in a line, if you put me, in, if you corral me and you say, choose, choose, choose wisely. <laughs> Denounce Jesus or accept what's before you. I will accept what's before me. Whether, it, whether it's, uh, whatever it is, whatever it is, I, I will choose it. I will not succumb, you know, for a few more years of life. I mean, think about it. I'm 55, I'm 57. Let's say something happens when I'm 67. The world, the world comes undone by 2030 according to Agenda 2030, right? So the UN, they have their Agenda 2030. What is, it, what is Agenda 2030? Agenda 2030 is when they are going to initiate Agenda 2030 that will take us to 2050. Agenda 2050 is when the whole agenda is in place, Agenda 21. So they have Agenda 21 that was released in 1994 at, Earth Day, at the Earth Day Summit in Rio de Janeiro. They released Agenda 21. Here is our plan for humanity. Here it is. Hideous. And then about four or five years ago, the Pope came here and suddenly we're talking about Agenda 2030. Ocasio-Cortez and Beto and some of the others they're pointing to 2030. You realize that? They're pointing to 2030 and they're saying if we don't do something by 2030, really bad things are going to happen. All right. So then, then, then in, in, 19, in uh, 2014, the Pope came, the UN came out with Agenda 2030, which is that by the year 2050, Agenda 21 would be fully in place. So let's say 10 years from now, 2030, uh, I'm standing before some sort of a tribunal or something. What, what's, what, what are my crimes? I'm a Christian. I'm pro-life. I'm anti-homosexual. I'm supporting Israel. These are the charges brought against me 10 years from now. And they basically offer me life. You have to denounce everything that you've been preaching. You have to denounce everything that you believe and embrace the mark of the beast. Agree with our system. And you'll have life. If you don't, you go, to a play, you, you, go, you go to another place where people are being processed, like Nazi Germany. I'm 67 years old at the time. What am I going to do for, for maybe 20 more years? <laughs> for two decades, I'm going to say, ah, no, I'm going to accept your offer. I mean, really. Even if I was 24 years old as a believer and faced with that offer, my choice would be s simple, clear. Give me the guillotine. I don't want your new world order. I don't want your beast government. That's what we should do. But I don't think, I don't think that every, everyone who says that they're Christians are able to make that decision. And why is this happening? Because our churches are not preparing our younger Christians for any type of faith, any type of conviction. In fact, and then in the other part of the church, we're preparing Christians to be, to be raptured out before it gets really bad. So when you're not raptured out and you're faced with these choices, you cave in right away. And, and this is one of my quarrels, one of my problems with the pre-rapture theory. Listen, again, I've said it before, the Chinese refused it offhand once they realized that it was not real because we, they went through terrible persecution. Africans today, the African Christian community, is being decimated by Islam. You can't convince them of a pre-tribulation rapture because they're experiencing already the horror of persecution at its worst level. The same type of persecution that we here in the West will ultimately suffer. So you say, hey, I'll give you 20 more years or you, know, you die. I said, listen, I have tinnitus. <laughs> I have tinnitus. <laughs> All right, I have tinnitus. My body isn't exactly what it used to be when I was 24. I struggle with sleep apnea at times. <laughs> you kidding me? <laughs> you kid <laughs> really? Really? You, you want me to choose? So, so the mark of God. I have the mark of God, in other words, and I'm not going to take the mark of the beast. I am going to stay with the mark of God. God has put his mark upon me, 
And nothing's going to remove that. All right, folks, let's, uh, next week we will